30 minutes ago. So you guys should all be very extremely excited for this. So uh, as my, I'm the CEO of Envene uh, that actually creates custom software for companies. So I am myself a TAMS graduate. I'll kind of go into my journey and kind of some of the tips I learned throughout my experience. But I really want to make it this more of a practical application about if you do eventually want to found your own technology company, what are the strategy and tips that can happen? Because you may not be at the point right now, but you can actually start setting yourself up for success. So in the future, you can actually found a very successful technology company. So let's go to the next slide. So who am I? So uh, I'll kind of I'll kind of go in reverse order. So as I mentioned, I'm the CEO of Envene. We do custom software development for healthcare companies. I've recently been named a Forbes Next 1000. Uh, as you'll notice, the picture of me looks different. That's because of Photoshop. Uh, and then uh, I've also won the National Aussie Genius Award winner for some work on my AI. I graduated from the University of Texas at Dallas on a full ride scholarship, actually in computer science. Uh, I'll kind of detail later that I didn't actually start in computer science despite teaching myself how to code in TAMS, I actually started out as a biomedical engineer. And that was one of the journey decisions I made throughout my career that really had a large impact was actually switching. Uh, in my free time, I am a mentor at Health Wildcatters. That is a top uh, healthcare accelerator in the Southwest. And I am a TAMS graduate of 2015. I'm currently turning 23. Well, I'm currently 23, turning 24 uh, this May. And uh, I'm in North Texas, 25 under 25. So that is who I am. Uh, my headquarters are actually now in McKinney. Uh, the city of McKinney recently gave us a grant to relocate over here. I used to have my headquarters in Richardson. So should you listen to anything I say? Probably not, no. But uh, I'm just throwing this out there because the thing is uh, I've been told a lot of advice and a lot of it's wrong and a lot of it doesn't apply to me. And a lot of it won't apply to you either. Because the thing is, is that each person's journey is different. Each person's personality is different. And also you have to do the steps. So I was told repeatedly throughout my career on some of the mistakes I made, people told me they were mistakes. I still made them anyway. So it's all about, a lot of times you have to actually make the mistake firsthand before you can start learning from it and you can actually start improving on it. So I'll kind of touch a little bit, kind of let's go back a little. Uh, my time's at TAM. So. Uh, I had a very, very interesting experience. Let me check chat real quick. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, I had a very interesting experience at TAM. So I am not like a lot of my friends. A lot of my friends really, really, really enjoyed TAMs. I did not. Now, this was kind of like my own fault because one of the things I didn't do was I didn't really get involved. So I didn't really know a lot of both my upperclassmen, my underclassmen, or even my peer group. I didn't know a lot of them. What I did most of my time was I stayed in, I stayed in my uh, apartment or whatever you call it, dorm, and I would either code or I would do schoolwork. So I was a top straight A student, but I really didn't connect with a lot of people. And that's a problem as you get older because these relationships you form now can actually be potential investors. They can be potential employees. They can be potential business partners. You miss out a lot of all these relationships that you can form because as you get older, as you get into business, you don't have as much time to spend with people just doing stupid things. When you get into business, it's all gonna be very focused. So that's one of the things I did wrong at TAMS was not focusing on maybe getting involved in clubs. That's why you guys are already doing so much better than me because I never attended a single hackathon while at TAMS, not one. Um, another, another thing is that it's important that you start like figuring out like what you wanna do now and not listening to like what your parents say. Because for example, I, my parents always like, James, you should be a doctor because computer science is gonna get shipped overseas. And the thing is, is that that is factually false, but those are just the things that you don't really question yet until you get into college and so you start doing classes, then you realize it. So you should start thinking about now, like who do you wanna be? Because a lot of kids, their parents, especially at TAMS are like, look, you need to be a doctor. You need to be an engineer. You need to be this, you need to be that. Well isn't really accurate because it's your fundamental life. So you got to start thinking now, like, who do you actually want to be? And what is your like vision and your plan? And, and a plan is literally, I don't know what I want to be. That is 100% acceptable, but you kind of need to go in with a strategy on what, what you want to do, because it kind of affects decisions you make now, which I'll touch on later, which is like college. What college you attend depend on your strategy and your North Star. So a couple of things you can do at TAMS to immediately increase your likelihood of a technology company. The first thing 
is going to be side projects. This is one of the best times ever to do side projects, do any coding hobbies, create calculators, create websites, do uh, some of my friends would like make League of Legends applications, just anything that you want. Uh, this is a great time to do it now because you have so much more free time. You, you think when you get into industry, you'll be like, oh, I will then be able to spend all my time free time coding. No, after you work a, a nine to five job or after you work, you know, more likely 8 a.m. to like 7 p.m., you'll be exhausted when you get home. You'll want to do nothing. So this is a great time to actually really build up your skills because one of the problems that I had when I first started my business was I didn't have enough skills because I didn't do enough side projects. I didn't yet know about API integrations with Stripe. I'd never done a Twilio integration. Twilio is basically how you send text messages via an API. So there, there's all these skills I was missing because I hadn't yet utilized uh, all my time effectively. And a big thing of that is doing side projects for fun because they really do matter. And when I touched later on college and internships, side projects are probably the number one thing you can do to make yourself competitive because everyone can take classes. Very few people are going to spend a lot of time doing side projects. Second thing is making a lot of friends and acquaintances. Now, uh, you, you'll, you'll be able to connect with them on LinkedIn later. I'm probably connected with maybe like 80 to 90 TAMS people. But the thing is, is you don't really have connections with them. And, and you really need connections when you start off because that will make someone, if you know someone better, they're willing to jump into your business. They're willing to join your company. They're willing to co-found with you compared to, you know, if you just talk to them in the halls a couple of times, come four years later, they're basically a random stranger you sort of know. So that it's just a key point while you guys think you're close, you'll eventually grow further apart. So, so you need to think about how do you start building those relationships now because those are very, very valuable. For example, I would probably have a couple more clients right now if I had uh, form close, well, one more client, uh, if I had formed closer relationships within my TAMS year because a couple of other guys founded companies that may actually be target customers of mine. But because I don't have that relationship basis, it's a lot harder for me to approach them and actually make them a client compared to if we had been friends during our years. So that'd be my suggestion there. It's kind of like, for example, why None of the employees I've ever hired have actually ever been TAMS people, despite them being very high quality. It's just because I don't have that relationship compared to my time at UTD, where almost all my uh, employees are from UTD because I formed very strong relationships there. So it is something to keep in mind about how are you building these relationships that can help propel your business forward. Third thing is invest in yourself. And what I mean by that is uh, doing those side projects, doing the things that you want to do now to make yourself more competitive in the future, even if they seem really stupid, because you can do almost anything and it will probably pay off dividends, except, you know, probably drinking or smoking, almost everything else will probably be great for you. So that would be really my suggestion is constantly invest in yourself and please do more side projects. Uh, I'll talk later about when I talk about internships and resumes that that's like the number one thing I look for when I hire people is uh, internships, 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 and then side projects. Okay, so uh, the, the thing that will eventually come up, I'm not sure if you're juniors or seniors, but eventually you'll have to do college applications. And to put it bluntly, uh, our culture cares about prestige. And what this means is that if you go to a better school, it will fundamentally be easier for you. If you go to UT, you'll have an easier time getting internships than if you go to UTD. And if you go to Harvard, it will be easier getting internships than if you went to UT. So there's a spectrum of prestige. The reason why prestige really matters is it opens doors. Prestige will never help you close something because we are fundamentally a meritocracy and a value-based society. But what prestige does is it allows you to get into opportunities that you usually couldn't does, and it gives you people the benefit of the doubt. If you go to a lower tier school, you can still be awesome. You can still make a ton of money. There are tons of people that are very, very successful at lower tier schools or didn't go to college at all. But if you go to a higher tier school, you're making your life easier for you. So I'm saying this as a very, you know, uh, disclaimer, because what I did was I aimed for only schools that could give me four rides. So I got four rides to multiple schools, and I eventually ended up at University of Texas at Dallas. Now, that made a lot of things more difficult to than me than I had things to prove, but I was extremely confident in my ability to found a business. Now, uh, I wouldn't do what I did fully because I literally didn't apply to any top tier schools at all. I only applied to schools that could give me four rides. So I would slightly suggest you should try applying more places because that may be a slight regret of mine uh, is maybe not, you know, I have no idea if I could have gotten to Harvard or Stanford or Yale. I have no idea. So uh, the thing is, is that if you don't try something, you have no idea if you can actually get it or if you can do it. 
and then it and then realize four years later you won't care anyway because after you graduate college uh it will open your couple of first opportunities no one cares after that fundamentally because uh what they care then is about what value you provide to them and as i mentioned it opens doors it doesn't help you close them um next one okay so my tips for college if you're like evaluating okay if i want to found a technical company in college what are some of the things i should look out for well the first thing is obviously prestige equals better the reason why prestige equals better is because all these tips kind of play together and it's it's a fact of life if you have a 2.0 from harvard and a 4.0 from utd people will think the Harvard guy is smarter. No joke. Now, eventually they realize he doesn't know anything, but it's just kind of how our society works and we're all susceptible to it. And I know I'm very susceptible to it. So it's just something to be um, on the lookout for. And one of the things you also need to think is how good is this area for startups? For example, everyone obviously knows Silicon Valley because you have Stanford there. Uh, you can look at like Boston, uh, which has biotech, NYU, which has a pretty strong financial sector. Uh, Austin is starting to grow around. Uh, actually, uh, in Utah, Salt Lake City has incredible entrepreneurship. Miami-Dade County in Florida has great stuff. So you don't have to just think, oh, I have to go to SF. There's a lot of other great entrepreneurship areas across the um, uh, nation. Or like you can even say Birmingham, Alabama for healthcare. Like there, there's a lot of subsectors you have to realize. Like if, if you look at DFW, what are we? We are a corporate headquarters town. So we're great for B2B technology. You should not found a B2C technology company if you're around here. Um, how good, what is the entrepreneurship scene like? Because really when you found a company, you really wanna be around other entrepreneurs. So you gotta think how good is the scene? I can tell you right now, North Texas isn't that best for entrepreneurs. I really like this, the state and our area, but that's just a fact of life. Austin is frankly much better. Um, this is a big one, is what is the alumni network at the school? You probably never think about this, but who are the alumni and are they big, do they, are they big company guys? What do they do? What industries are they in? Because alumni are an untapped research, especially for founding companies. Um, let me just check chat real quick. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so in technology, so uh, Jingwan Choi asks, could you explain what a B2C company is? So um, there's multiple types of companies that sell services to end customers. So a B2B company is a business to business company. I'm a business selling a technology to another business. Let's take the example of Salesforce, for example, which is an enterprise CRM. Uh, what, what you basically do is your, your Salesforce will go and sell it to a company like mine, Inveen. Now, Facebook is a B2C company, business to consumer, which means it's more broad based to consumers and usually sold via advertising. So Google search is a B2C company, uh, Facebook is B2C, Snapchat is B2C, TikTok is B2C, B2B more sells to other businesses. So one of the reasons why an SF is very good at B2C technology is because there's a lot of capital around there. And to build a good B2C company, you need scale. You need a lot of capital, you need to capture the market, you have network effects, you need to capture everything. Compared to B2B technology, which is more enterprise, where it's okay if you have less money because you can get enterprise contracts with the last longer compared to, you know, consumers who are very flighty and you have to get lots of them due to network effects. So that's kind of like a high level. Um, the other type is called B2G, which is business to government. That is where businesses sell stuff to government. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole different topic. And usually those sales cycles are incredible. So to loop back to my original point is, um, what is the alumni network? Because alumni are a big deal. You're, you're, it's very likely you'll probably be hired by a potential alumni from your school. Uh, and like who recruits from campuses depends on a lot of alumni. And they also will compose a lot of the angel investors in your local area. So one of the reasons why uh, UTD may not be the best school for entrepreneurship is we have, we really don't have a great alumni network. We really don't have great angel investors. So that really hurts us from a company standpoint. Like we have a couple of CEOs in our alumni network, but they're not like the big angels that you want from say like a UT or, you know, a big state school. Like if you go to a big state school, even if it's not well-renowned, look, if you go to University of Arkansas, even though they're not known for entrepreneurship, there's going to be a lot of great alumni. In there. But the more kind of offshoot you end towards, you end, you start getting away from the angel investors. It starts to become harder to raise capital. 
So that, that's a big thing to think about in the future is that, hey, um, if you raise capital, how does that look? So I'll kind of talk about um, the difference between uh, what kind of the investors are. So there's multiple types of investors that can invest in your company. The first thing is there's something called venture capitalists. Venture capitalists basically get money from LPs, which are limited partners, basically mutual funds, very rich people, um, all sorts of kind of uh, uh, institutional money goes into a VC. A VC will then invest and they're basically like an institutional investor. Then there is something called private equity. PE usually buys controlling stakes in companies, uh, operate it for multiple years, and then they sell the company. Then there is angel investors. Angel investors are usually um, rich individuals who will invest money in your startup. They can be anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000 to $500,000. So usually the reason why angel investors are so important is a VC usually won't look at your company in the early stages because it's too risky. A angel investor though, in the early stages of your company will actually maybe willing to write a check. Let's say you have this idea. Let's say you have a prototype, but you have no customers. VC is not going to write you a check. An angel investor, though, might, depending if they believe in your idea, you pitch them well enough, and they see the value prop, an angel investor might invest it. So an angel investor is usually a guy who has at least $1 million in net worth and is willing to write a small check, usually in the seed or pre-seed round. A seed or pre-seed round is basically just a form of rounds when companies raise money. And then there's another difference is that it, bootstrapping is where you never actually raise outside investment. So my company is bootstrapped. I have no angels on my uh, term sheets. Okay, next one. Okay, so as I mentioned, I ended up at the University of Texas at Dallas. And one thing to note is that uh, I kind of knew this going in. It's not the best social life. It's a very commuter campus. Uh, I did much, much better job though, forming more relationships compared to TAMS where I realized I made a large mistake by not learning how to build those relationships. I used to be, I did a much better job. I have a very, very strong network of potential hires all coming from UTD, which is very good. So one of the things I learned was always go for the best internship. So I went to very low class internships uh, during my time at UTD. I ended up doing Gallup, which is basically a data analytics firm. And that ended up being a mistake for two reasons. Uh, because really the more, as I mentioned earlier, the more prestige you have, the better you do. If you have a Google and Amazon, a Facebook and Netflix on your resume, that looks better compared to, you know, a Gallup. So that's something to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is you probably shouldn't go to the same internship twice, like I did. So the problem with going to the same internship twice is you're not, what most people do is uh, freshman year, they'll get a very, very bad internship, just anything they can get. And then sophomore year, they'll jump. And then uh, then junior year, they'll be able to land like an Amazon or a Microsoft or a Facebook. So you got to think of it as a stretch. Like your first internship will suck. It always sucks. But but you just got to get something because something leads to another thing. So another thing is that I did attend a couple of hackathons, but I should have attended more because hackathons are great recruiting fodder. And it's great for starting to form relationships. Another thing you guys will face is that There'll be tons of business plan competitions, which I did a lot of. Business plans aren't business. So that's something I have to realize is that you'll think you'll be involved in entrepreneurship because look how many business plans you're creating. Look how much you're competing. That isn't business. Business is selling to customers and getting revenue from people. That's business. So that's something I would keep in mind is that like focus on business if you want to have a company, not business plans and not the competition because universities want to make entrepreneurship seem exciting for everyone when in reality entrepreneurship sucks so you have to really keep that in mind um okay so i'll kind of talk so the, my my first two years in college uh went to Gallup both times and then in my senior year because i graduated in three years i founded my first real business called degree champ and what degree champ was was it was automated college advising using ai the purpose was to help students graduate quicker with less student debt. The reason why I actually founded this was because I actually started out my career as a biomedical engineer student. When I switched over to CS, uh, they actually didn't take a lot of my credits because they didn't say they qualified and I got the wrong advice as biomed when I was switching to CS. So I had to basically retake the CS intro courses twice and that it was horrible, hated myself because it was basically a waste of my time, basically burned away all my time because I could have clepped out of it anyway. 
So there, there was all these problems involved. So I created this solution using um, artificial intelligence and basically rule-based domain expertise. Basically, if you're familiar with the AlphaGo program, it's kind of similar to that. It's just a basically a very simple decision tree on like how decisions get made. So I founded this business and I started coding on it. This was kind of the first time I'd ever really coded on something real. Uh, because you know how I mentioned the side projects? This was like my first real application. So basically, I decided to start my side project to be a real business. So the code quality wasn't great. Had a lot of learning to do like what it means to be infant what infrastructure should be, what should the architecture be. So I made a lot of bad decisions there. I didn't even know there was something called AWS, Amazon Web Services, or you know, uh, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. I literally put it on Heroku, which by the way is not a bad decision. Heroku is great. But um, as I was doing Degree Champ, um, as I was doing it, I kind of recruited some students. Those students eventually didn't work out because they didn't put any time into it. I was building it, building it, building it. And then I won something called the Aussie Genius Award. Award. Basically what it was is that it was a national competition where eventually I won an award that basically gave me some money so I could spend money on it. And then what happened is in your last year of uh, senior year of your computer science program or your engineering program, you'll do something called a senior capstone. This is where you get a team of students to work on someone's project. And uh, I wanted to work on my own company. Uh, UTD told me no. I asked them again. They told me no. I asked them again. They told me no. I won the National Aussie Genius Award. I asked them again. They were like, yes, James, we will, which is why prestige helps is because once they saw I won an award, they're like, oh, wait, let's reevaluate this decision. This could actually be a real thing. So what happened is I got a team of students on my team. So it was five of us all working on my idea called Degree Champ. So I was working on it, working on it. And this is kind of where my fun... Um, uh, there were some things that happened during, for example, a guy who sold his company for, let's say, 20 to $40 million wanted me to partner on it. We'd split it 50-50. I'd be the technologist. He'll be the CEO. I said no. And the reason why I said no was because, one, I was a really, really arrogant person because I thought, oh, I can make it. I can make it successful. The second thing was I got very, very bad vibes from him. You know, kind of the thing where you just start like shaking and where you internally are like, oh, this guy's going to take my company and steal it. Now, what do you have? Yeah, probably not, but I'm very happy the decision I made because I like where I am now. And this is where my fundamental tip number one is, which is what I can't stress enough, you must learn how to sell. I don't care if you're a technologist, you must learn how to sell. Everything that you do, it must be selling. The reason why is because the reason why Degree Champ failed was because I didn't know how to sell. Uh, and what, what happened is I talked to these colleges, like, oh, it's exciting, and I didn't know how to follow up on them. I didn't know how to use a CRM. A CRM is called a customer relationship management. It's basically used to keep track of all the tasks you need to do to sell something. So in sales, it's all about following up and it's all about relationships and all about timely action. You've got to use a CRM to be successful. So the biggest problem with Degree Champ was I didn't know how to sell, which means that, you know, I couldn't close any deals, which means I couldn't fundraise, which means I can do this, I can do that. So I didn't know how to sell because... Uh, I also didn't know what worked for me because like I would try calling people up cold and I sucked at it, send emails. I couldn't get anyone to respond to me. So I try all these things and nothing worked. So um, it's very, very important for uh, as you that, that, and what I make excuses like, Oh, I'll just recruit a salesperson. You can't recruit a salesperson. You got to sell. So that's something I would be kind of suggesting to all you is that, in the beginning stages, you got to learn how to sell because otherwise you won't be successful. And it's also like too. fundamentally, everything you do in life is a sale. Get a girlfriend, get a boyfriend. That's a sale. You're, you're selling them on yourselves. Get a job. That's a sale. Recruiting employees, sale, investors, sales, customers, sale. Everything you do in life is fundamentally a sale. And one of the things that you do selling is number one, uh, be likable. Being likable very much helps. Sort of smiling. Very easy to do. Um, and then the second thing is figure out what your value prop is and like how you help people because everyone always has a value prop. Fundamental tip number two, be open to pivots. So I, I graduated college. I was still working on Degree Champ. I hired someone out of my UT design program, which was a capstone project to kind of join me on the project. Um, I was paying him terribly. Uh, literally, I was paying him $10 an hour to work with me on this project. And the, only, and the reason why he did was because he hated interviewing at companies. So it was like, yeah, sure, James, I'll work with you. 
So while I was doing that, um, we were working on it, working on it, working on it. Every day a mentor of mine would come to me and say, James, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Go get a real job. Go get a real job. Uh, because he knew it wasn't going to work out. This guy's very successful. He built a company that did $800 million per year. So he was telling me, hey, you need, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. And then one, and we were running out of cash. And he would like, he would just throw that in my face every day. Hey, hey, how's your cash doing? Hmm, yeah, wonder what's happening. So he would just hit me on it constantly. But I'm, a, I'm stubborn. I'm super stubborn. Um, and this is one of the things I had to learn was be open to pivot. One day he approaches me. He's like, hey, James, what about, what do you think about consulting? I'm like, no, I hate consulting. I'll never do consulting. I'll never do services. Um, if you read a lot of tech crunch, what you'll get is you'll get something called product envy, which it means you're always want to build a SaaS product. A SaaS product is software as a service. The reason why you want SaaS products is because they have reoccurring revenue. Uh, companies with reoccurring revenue trade on multiples of revenue, not EBITDA. EBITDA is basically the um, earnings before interest, tax, uh, tax appreciation, and debt. Basically, what it represents is it represents your profit. So services companies like mine trade off profit compared to, you know, companies that have recurring revenue, which trade off revenue. The reason why that's a big deal is because you, a lot of companies have very low earnings, but a lot of revenue. So um, I never wanted to have a services company ever. And I said that I'd say that. And then one day he's like, James, uh, I have a, you should go meet the CEO I'm thinking of investing in. And because they need some help. And I was like, fine, I'll talk to them. So I talked to that CEO that day. He's a healthcare company. What they do is they create uh, labels for um, anesthesiology operating rooms to help reduce uh, the risk of non-compliance on syringes because a lot of these hospitals have been sued because they're not labeling the syringes because it's a hand process. They automated it. So go into that meeting. And then in that day, I close that deal. So my first ever deal I ever closed was for $10,000. Uh, $10,000 deal for three months. Um, which was just myself working on, which was a godsend because it was, it was a lot of money. 10,000 now may not seem much, but for me then it was a lot of money. So uh, I, so I was open and by being open to that idea to being open to the idea of pivoting it actually turned out to be a really, really good for my business and that you can't get married to who you think you are and who you want to be because you don't yet know who you're going to be until you start having some success. You shouldn't like start trying to fit yourself into a square peg. Because you'll surprise yourself because I never in a million years would guess I'd have a custom software development firm. I had a low opinion of custom software development firms, but it just kind of happened that way. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I thought I would absolutely hate consulting. Turns out I loved it. Turns out I was really good at it. Turns out that uh, I could figure out how to get customers at it and the sale of consulting was so much easier than a product. Literally in consulting, or which I call services, all I had to do was listen to people's problems and propose a solution. So it turned out to be a great fit for me and my personality. Now, the, the problem was, is that I was still doing degree change. So I was doing these two things. I was doing services and I was doing uh, my product company. What happened though, is that both were kind of floundering. Neither was growing like I wanted. Degree champ still didn't have any customers. I mean, I had some pilots, but they're I, like, it was going to be hard to get them to customers. And then I had this services company that I just wasn't giving enough fuel to. So eventually I had to choose one or the other of like, Hey, do I continue to agree champ? Do I really want to be a product guy? Or am I going to be a services guy? And you have to choose because you'll notice all the big guys will diversify, but they always make all their money on one thing. Anyone really successful will always make their money on one thing by being hyper-focused because life is too hard to make money in everything. The only people that can do everything are rich people. So especially when you're younger, you gotta be like, look, what is my one thing? What am I gonna do? Because, because you don't have the uh, benefit of diversifying. So obviously what I did, I closed down Degree Champ, moved over all my employees to Envy. By then I had three employees on Degree Champ. How I got the second employee on Degree Champ? Well, I hired them with the money from Envy. So I was literally spending money from Envine I was making and spending it on Degree Champ. Eventually I looked at my negative. I think I spent like $80,000 on Degree Champ of my own money. Literally that I made via internships, via consulting. And then eventually I just closed it down. Best decision of my life. Um, and I admit when I made the decision, uh, I don't cry, but I did cry in my shower. And that was like the last time I cried in like the last four years. 
So it sucks. It really sucks to close down a business and you invested hours into it. But fundamentally, it was a great decision. And sometimes you have to make the hard decisions to like really improve yourself and where you're going. But it's, it's not all rainbows and ponies. Running a business is very, very hard. So I'm going to kind of give you some honest struggles of things I've had with Embiid. Number one, cash flow. Um, the, the reason cash is king, it's a very common saying in business. But the, the problem that happens is, especially in the services industry, you have to do work, pay your employees, and then you get paid at a later date. So let's say you get paid net 30, which means you do the work, then you probably get paid 30 days later. That can create a cash crunch where there's not a lot of cash. So at one point in time with Veen, last year, actually, uh, middle of the year, actually two years ago, maybe now, um, I ran into a cash crunch where I was fully booked. We were all we were all working, but we were losing money, which is a big deal. So we we were not sustainable. So eventually, I had to figure out how to turn around my business model. And a business model in consulting, you have two models. You can do time materials, which is hourly, or you can do fixed big contracts. Originally, I was doing fixed big contracts, but doing them very wrong. So I had to outlaw them at my business and then only go to time materials, so I would stop burning cash. And because I'm the only one that closes deals, I literally outlawed myself from doing one of the two revenue models because I just sucked at it. And you kind of have to realize, oh, I just don't know how to make this work. Uh, how you make fixed big contracts work is you have a very tight scope document, which are uh, requirements of the code. And then what you do is if they ever change, you have to hit them with a change request. I was very bad at that. Um, another thing that's been a large struggle with the mean is when to grow at what point? Because I like growing. I like hiring more people. We're currently five. I want to get to 100. Well, I want to get to 10. I want to get to 20. I want to get to 100. Like, and I'm always thinking about growth, 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 growth. The problem is, is that sometimes you'll try to jump steps on where you are. Like, for example, right now, I should not hire a salesperson. But I really want to hire a salesperson just because it would make me very happy. So um, it's kind of like I have to constantly hold myself back so I don't make a mistake about where I'm heading and try to grow too fast because uh, growing too slow and growing too fast can both kill you. You need to grow the right amount. Another thing has been trying to figure out who my target customer is because there's been a lot of iteration. I did not starting out, when I started out, I thought hospital clients were gonna, hospital systems were gonna be my target client. After doing work with the hospital system, they are not. Hospital systems are not my target client at this size. You need to figure out when you're selling, when you're selling a product, who's your target customer and if they match who you're aiming for and if you can reach them. Like, look, if your target customer is billionaires, but you have no way to meet a billionaire, it's irrelevant. You can't sell to them. So uh, one of the things I found great success with is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a godsend. LinkedIn is how I've got almost all my sales. So you should be using LinkedIn. You should form a profile on it. You should connect with people. And you should always, like, you'd be surprised just the level of CEOs that are LinkedIn. Anyone that's a legit CEO who's probably under 50 has a LinkedIn. So you should have a LinkedIn. You should start, you know, working on it. You should have great people on your LinkedIn. You should connect with people on LinkedIn. It's excellent. Uh, and get a professional photo on LinkedIn because it matters. And when you send connection requests, make sure to actually send um, words in your connection request. For example, uh, to do this talk, uh, Kanav pinged me on LinkedIn. Everyone's on LinkedIn. Everyone is on LinkedIn. Okay, so okay, some of the learnings I have through uh, Amin is hire great people. People really do make matter. Uh, and people ca cost money though. People are expensive. Good people are very expensive. Um, so you can't just like BS it via uh, students. You have to, you know, actually get real professionals. Another thing is finding the clients that adore you. Uh, I've actually turned down deals before because sometimes you're like, go in and you're like, get the feeling that it won't be a massive success. In which case, sometimes when you're small, you should turn those down because if your early stages matter so much because in the early stages, you're so easy to kill. So you need to have people that love you and adore you and help stick with you. Next thing is sell, 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 sell. When I get off this call, I have to go do like 30 cold LinkedIn reach outs. Well, more like 60, but I'll realistically only do like 30. Um, so you got to constantly be selling. You got to, you got to constantly be going out there and hunting because if you're not growing your diet, so you have to put yourself out there. Um, good mentors are very rare. Like, look, I, I probably know hundreds of CEOs uh, who are very successful 
and like have tons of money, but good mentorship is very rare because it takes two to tango and they have to be willing to give you honest advice. Uh, most mentors will not give you honest advice because they don't know you well enough yet. If you truly form a good relationship and they think that you'll take their advice, they start giving it to you, but good advice sucks because it hurts. Good advice is telling me, James, you should do services, not product. That is good advice. Good advice is you should close down degree champ. Good advice is painful. So that, that's just something to think about is becoming a pe person that people want to mentor and give advice to because great people do want to mentor the up and coming. Uh, they do want to give back their time if someone's rich. Rich people are actually, when you meet them, are some of the kindest and most giving people are willing to open their networks. But you have to be worth giving value to which means you have to try to strive yourself to be the best as possible. And people that are experienced entrepreneurs, maybe in their 50s or 60s, who have made a lot of money, want to give back to the next stage. They want to help, but they do not want to waste their time. They want to give it to someone that will be a winner. So it's just something they have to think about. Um, next thing is success takes a long time. And what I mean by this is it'll take you a long time. So I've already been pretty successful. Uh, but if I look back where I wanted to be, this, I'd be a failure. So I, I thought I'd be a millionaire by 22, a multimillionaire by the time I was uh, 23, and then a billionaire by the time I'm 40. I'm nowhere close to that. It'll probably take me till like I'm 30 till I literally, until I have a million dollars. It, it's just kind of a fact of life. And you have to kind of accept that, that your preconceived notions of where you're going to be may not be correct. And that, that your success may take a long time. A career is a long time. You probably have 40 years of working. That's a long time to create a reputation. So it's okay if it takes you a while. It's okay if, if you graduate college and you want to work at a big company, go do it. Do not need to found a company immediately out of college. It sucks founding a company immediately out of college. You probably don't have the relationships. You don't have the client networks. You, there's so many things you lack the experience. You don't have a good domain problem. The reason why most college startups suck is because they don't solve problems that uh, people with money have. College students solve problems of other college students, but college students are poor. You know who you want to solve problems for? CEOs. If you solve problems for CEOs and business owners, we pay money. My business pays tens of thousands of dollars each year in software because they solve our problem. So you got to think about that, that it's okay if, look, if you don't found a company to your 40, that's fine. Like it doesn't make you less of an entrepreneur. You just have to have that in your mind um, on what you want success to be. So for example, uh, like where we're going, it, it took us a while. Like we're kind of in the third year of our full operations and now we're really starting to get going. I'm really starting to figure out, it just takes forever to like start to figure it out. So be kind to yourself about, hey, if I'm not hitting success enough, it will take a while and it'll take a lot of constrained work. It will take much longer than you think. This is my last slide on kind of overall tips. Um, my suggestion is always be networking and building relationships. You never know who people turn up. For all you know, one of the people in this call could be a billionaire in 40 years. You have no idea where people end up and what relationships matter. And it's always better to form a relationship earlier because it's almost more true when you form it earlier when someone's successful. It's just a fact of life. You probably value those more. So always be trying to build relationships. Always try to be out of value. The second one is prestige does matter, but it's not the end all be all. Uh, prestige opens doors, but fundamentally, uh, eventually your reputation does catch up to you if you do good work or not, if you are truly worth of it. So, but the thing is, is that if you couple prestige with actual talent, then it gets terrifying. Marketing matters. And what I mean by that is things like LinkedIn are so important. You got to have a good presence. Um, you got to have a good professional presence, which kind of leads into the fourth tip, which is, don't do anything stupid on social media. And this is, and I'm mentioning this because you guys are younger. Um, you may be like, hey, I'm going to post something on Twitter. Don't, just don't. The, the reason why is because when, when people are hiring you, they check out your Twitter, they check out your Facebook, they checked out your Instagram. And if you post stupid things, they're not going to hire you. So that, that's just a suggestion. Like, look, in college, you guys will probably go to frat parties or go to parties or something. Don't post those pictures online. Um, or, you know, you may be very political. Don't post your political uh, thoughts online. Just just try to be, well, when you think about that, think about yourself as a professional and the corporate world is very boring and they, they dislike anything that's weird or out of there. 
So just don't post that on your name, post it on a student name. Just be very, very careful nowadays because as we get more and more polarized, um, there's more and more reasons why people don't, you don't want it to be a demerit against you. So I would just be thinking about what you're posting on social media because it will probably come back to bite you if you don't think about it now. So that, that's just my last tip. And that's just a prerogatory warning. I have no Twitter or Facebook because I would probably post something stupid. So I just know better. So that's why I just don't even deal with it. So that is my end of my presentation. This is my contact information. I'm also not very hard to find on LinkedIn. I'm probably one of the first people that pops up. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so you mentioned that like your mom said that uh, don't go into technology because they'll get shipped overseas, right? So where do you see kind of technology companies being in maybe 10 to 30 years from now? So um, it was actually my father that said that because oh, he is a bad. PhD Sorry. and engineer, but you're hundred percent right. He said that they'll, they'll all be shipped off um, because a lot of boomers, when they grew up, that's when the outsourcing trend happened where all the jobs got moved overseas to China, to India, to Romania. So it scared a lot of them. So where I kind of see it is that we will always need software engineers and great programmers in the US because one will still remain probably one of the top, top uh, economies. China may eventually take us probably not in the 10, 20 years, probably 40 years from now. Um, but we will always have a very, very strong software development industry. I'm not one of the people that thinks that COVID all COVID did was make it more likely to have international work, but fundamentally, you still need your engineers in the U.S. to do work because they understand the domain, they understand the culture, and they know how to work together. Um, where do I think it's heading? Um, I think it's, gonna, it's just going to keep going up. They're just going to keep hiring more and more people. There's a saying nowadays, every company is a technology company now. Every company needs software engineers. Software engineering will probably be the best paid profession in the U.S., and you can see this because even with all the proliferation of boot camps, even with all the CS grads, there's tons and tons of more. There's a voracious appetite for it. And not only that, there, there's a voracious appetite. And if you're good, there's even more things to be had. Like there, there's a ton of, there's a ton of bad stuff out there. There's a ton of mediocre garbage. So if you're good, then it opens these, all these other opportunities. So if you're like, hey, where do I think it's going? I think there'd be a massive expansion. I think there's going to be a lot more. And I think eventually um, what our politicians are eventually going to get smart and ban a lot of outsourcing. I think in 30, 40 years, I think a nationalist will come along and actually ban all outsourcing of tech or force companies that have private data to be based in the US. So I am very, very positive of it. And that I have a very, I think, I think it'll be massive. That, that's my opinion. Uh, because I, I look at the hiring, it's only going up, man. Every day, my friends are hiring more software engineers. Are you into like any any books and like do you have any suggestions for like just any books and in, in considered like uh, entrepreneurship or literally any topic? So, any suggestions? Um, one of the books that really inspired me was called The Fast Lane Millionaire, and I don't know who that guy wrote it, uh, but I I have a bad relationship with books which is I have this book reading list of all the books I should read and all these brilliant CEOs suggest me to read and I've never read. So, uh, no, no. Uh, that Fastlane Millionaire made a difference to me because that's how I found a degree champ in it. And when I was doing my internship, that's what I read that really convinced me that I really should focus on trying to create substantial value instead of trading my time for money. But that's literally what I do now is I trade my time for money. So, like, I don't know. I've never been a big book guy. Um, I believe, da, 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 and I have been rediscovered and put a, <laughs> yep. Uh, that's a great point, uh, Zulu, is that, uh, that yeah, they, they, everything will get rediscovered on you. So be very, very, very careful because you, because what may happen is 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you may be going for a promotion. You may be going for an investor. Your competitor doesn't want you to get it. They'll leak it. They will send it to their competitor. Business is ruthless. Like people will stomp each other in the face. Like that's so. Like if you're like, hey, could this video be used to incriminate me? Don't do it.
Okay, so you mentioned that it's really important to do side projects. So what are some examples of side projects that you did either in your time at TAMS or in college? So uh, one of the things I did was uh, I, I was playing, I played around with Unity a lot. So creating a game called Imperfect Heroes where I was building a turn-based strategy game based off a popular Nintendo franchise called Fire Emblem. So uh, I played around with that and kind of did that because I always thought I wanted to get into game development. Um, some other side projects I did was uh, I played a little around with virtual reality and some hardware and some Arduinos, but I did not do anywhere near the side projects all my friends did. The side projects that look good are literally projects that you want to do because that, that's all that matters is that if you like it, but uh, the reason why I never carried on with Imperfect Heroes was because I eventually realized, oh, wait, I didn't actually want to create games for a living. I always thought I did. But when it came down to actually creating a game, I didn't want to do it, which is why process is so important is that you got to love the process. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. Wait, so how did you get the Forbes Next 1000? Like, was it just like an application type thing or did they kind of reach out to you? Uh, it's an application thing, which is hilarious because I thought I would never get it. Honestly, uh, I, I li the only reason I applied was I called my mom and I'm like, yeah, you know, I, this happened. I'm not going to apply for it. She's like, you're going to apply for it. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, you're going to apply because I thought the same thing with the Aussie Genius Award. There was no way I was going to get it. So literally, it's just kind of putting yourself out there. Um, a lot of these awards, what happens is they're either nominated or you or you apply yourself. So like Forbes 30 under 30, what that actually is is that's usually, a lot of times it's actually a self-nomination. So, and then you get letters of recommendation, it's a whole process. So these things are processes, um, which is why it kind of plays into marketing and prestige is that it, it looks really, really good. But if you dove under it, you'd be like, wait, did, did you really apply yourself? And I'm like, yes. Okay, so I guess everyone procrastinates a lot. Um, so do you have any maybe tips or how do you combat that? And how do you stay productive rather than, um, I guess, waste your time on procrastination? So, uh, I mean, you're always going to procrastinate. It's just a fact of life. So, for example, this presentation I created 20 minutes before this talk. I started it at 1025. If you're like, like I had all these big ideas of everything I was going to do. Like, I was going to be like, oh, this, I'm going to impress their socks off. Didn't happen. Okay. I mean, just a fact of life. Uh, I played golf this morning, came back. I laid on my bed for like an hour and I was like, oh, S-H-I-T. I uh, got to run, got to do it. So sorry, it will always be a fact of life. One of the things is, is that really making sure that you have a good uh, list of what you need to do. So I, my list, what I utilize, is, uh, I utilize something called the full focus planner where I plan each of my days and have a list. What's, what's really worked for me is trying to do things early and often and setting it up uh, so I can get into the role. Because I find out that if I don't get into the role within a day, I do really bad. And that all starts with the morning. Because if I have a bad morning, if I sleep in, if I screw around in the morning, I do not have a good day. So for me, it's all about momentum and making sure that you're constantly getting in the habit of doing good things. The next thing is, is that, I've always found that like with writing essays, so like I write blogs to help build my content leadership in the market. It really helps if you start out and you have to find a way to get yourself to the computer because it's usually all the first words that hurt. So give yourself the easiest task possible. So be like, hey, I'm gonna turn on my computer. That counts as a task. Just trying to figure out ways to stop it because you, you will always procrastinate. Everyone procrastinate. And then the third thing is, is that procrastination is usually a mechanism for three reasons. One, it's a revealer. Maybe you don't actually care about it. Uh, and that, that's always scary to think about is that maybe you're procrastinating on it because you actually just don't want to do it or it doesn't apply to who you want to be. And it, the second reason is scary because you may be procrastinating on it because it's scary. Like let's say you're perfectionist, you're scared of creating bad work. The third reason is because of fear. You may be fearful of it. Let's say you're procrastinating on sending an email to a CEO for mentorship. You're probably fearful of it because what if they reject you? So a lot of procrastination is actually emotional management and how you're managing your mindful state. So there's a lot of these tips and tricks, but fundamentally it comes down to how do you manage your emotions to get it successful? 
because you're, you're going to procrastinate all your life. Just a fact. Uh, where would you get ideas to do size projects? Uh, and how much experience did you have when you went to TAMS? I had zero experience. Zero. Uh, I taught myself how to code at TAMS uh, with a book. So I bought a learning how to code C++ book or something, and I code in C++. That's literally how I learned. So I had zero. And where would you get ideas to do side projects? Google. Just type in, uh, think about like what language you want to learn, like C Sharp. Side projects for C Sharp. Build a calculator, build a weather thing, connect with APIs, build a Twitter aggregation bot. Um, if, if you're like having struggle with it, just kind of build, th think about like, or what you could do is you could build replicas of website, build a Twitter clone, build a Facebook clone. Um, or, or think about things that you like. For example, if you're like, look, I really like clothes. Okay, build a fake e-commerce shop. It's, it's just trying to figure out like things that will motivate you and make sure that you like it. Because if you're just building side projects for side projects, I found, is that a lot of times you give up on them because they don't interest you. So build something that's just kind of fun or that can help someone. Or, or what you can do actually is that um, side projects that help maybe your parents can also be valuable. So for example, my mom uh, is a published author and also has uh, fabric named after her. So I would I'd create little side projects where I would scrape all these quilt guild members data so then she could email them to help her sell more fabric. Like little things like that, that built up a lot of uh, skills with uh, headless requests and building HTML parsing. So you can build up a lot of skills by figuring out like, what are things that are valuable? Because a lot of side products, the reason why people don't do them is because no one actually uses them and they're not valuable. If you can figure out a way, even in the stupidest way to make something valuable, then it becomes cool. So I guess that kind of uh, hits our one hour mark. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to <clears throat> message <clears throat> me or one of the other execs and we'll send it over to James. Does that sound good? Sounds so. good to me. <clears throat> All right, it's cool. Um, I'll stop the recording here.